That's the canary in the coal mine that you'll see the largest temperature increases at the polar regions of the planet. So um, what is really happening there? Well, in the Arctic, yes, uh, the Arctic ice and the temperature in the Arctic, the Arctic ice have been receding, the temperatures have warmed, but there is a significant amount of evidence that suggests that it's no warmer in the Arctic presently than it was in the 1930s and 1940s, okay, which again would have been a natural climate fluctuation. But in contrast with that, we can go down to the southern hemisphere and look at the South Pole. And what's happening there, we have some good data over the last three decades. And in fact, um, it shows that, yes, the Antarctic Peninsula has warmed, but over the entire, if you integrate temperatures over the entire um, South Pole region, you see that there's no trend in temperature over the last 20, 30 years or more. And in fact, sea ice, the, the most up-to-date available uh, data that exists for sea ice show that sea ice around that continent, the southern, you know, South American continent, or not South American, excuse me, the the um, Antarctic continent, yeah. yes, Antarctica continent is actually expanding towards the equator. I, I read that, and uh, I, I thought, well, maybe you, the North Pole is reducing a little bit, the South Pole is increasing a little bit. It's, it's a wash. So, yeah, you know, you know, here you have one aspect that you know the, the alarmists would point to and say, well, the you know certainly you see signs of global warming in the North Pole, but they will never acknowledge the fact that down in the South Pole. You know, it's completely opposite of their projections. Or you can look at a map of Florida and notice that it hasn't changed the water level, <laughs> right? This is another great point about, about sea level rise, okay? There's been several studies that I've reviewed on my website that uh, look at sea level. And what you find that, uh, sea, you know, sea levels have been rising since the end of the last great ice age 22,000 years ago, all right? That's a normal fluctuation. You have this inherent... Um, lag in the, in the in the temperatures affecting and melting that ice. It's like a, a turkey. You know, if you freeze a turkey and then you pull it out of your of your freezer and, and let it thaw, it takes a while for it to thaw. Right. Well, same type of thing with the Earth. It's taken a while to melt those those great ice sheets, and so the sea levels have been rising for the last 22,000 years, give or take. But the interesting thing about the data that you can look at most recently over the last century or so, you find that these tide gauges show that the uh, sea level rise is not accelerating. In fact, there's very good evidence that suggests it's decelerating over the last couple of decades, which again um, is in stark contrast and disagreement with the model projections. So we see a sea level rise of only about between one and two millimeters per year, whereas the IPCC suggests we should have you know, a factor of 10 more than that. So in your lecture, you pointed out a very elementary and obvious fact, which most people learn in their class of biology, which is that plants need CO2 to live, and increases in CO2 have tremendous benefits. Absolutely right. Um, carbon dioxide, you know, is, in addition to being a greenhouse gas, it is the food for plants that sustains them. They need it. They must have carbon dioxide to photosynthesize, to grow, to produce their tissues. Um, and the fact is that there have been thousands of studies that have looked at how will plants respond as the CO2 concentration rises. And overwhelmingly, uh, they show that as the CO2 increases, plant growth and productivity increases. Uh, we expect that you'll see about a, anywhere from a 35 to 55 percent increase in, in crop biomass and uh, natural ecosystem biomass. And so more oxygen for us. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, as they exhale some oxygen as well. I love plants, because <laughs> they produce that oxygen. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. So this is another thing that most people don't uh, consider. And um, I think one of the problems with this issue as a political issue is with the term climate change, which is, I see it, means everything and nothing <laughs> in particular. So because you cannot, there is no number that measures climate change. There is a number that measures temperature. So you recall they, the people used to say global warming. Now that's something that can be disproved. The temperature doesn't go up, you know it's wrong. But how do you disprove climate change? Well, what, first of all, you got to clarify, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> well, you know, I think there's, there's probably several reasons why they switched their, their keyword or use of this debate from global warming to climate change. And one could point to the fact that the temperatures are not warming to the degree 
that they expected. So a lot of, you know, a lot of the shift went towards climate change because that includes, you know, what's happening with droughts and floods and that sort of thing. And, and you know who what? can measure that? Well, you know, I mean, well, uh, well, but, how, what, but, but what number that, are you going to assign to hurricanes? What number are you going to assign to floods? What number? But, but beyond that, you can find any, you can find some place in this globe that's experiencing a drought or some place that's experiencing a flood. That is normal. As a normal part of climate, that anywhere on the Earth, anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of the Earth's uh, surface is experiencing a drought or a flood. So you can you can pull that image wherever it is and say, you know, this is being caused by CO2, and use that as your propaganda, so to speak. But it's not the proof, and it's not proof. In fact, if you look at the real-world data that exists, the observations that we do have and can look at, 